Hi, I'm a possum and I find garbage. Today's garbage is the Emoji Movie. Now, I'm not going to subject my audience to an overly long, melodramatic, hyperbolic intro that tries to make it sound like this is the worst movie ever made. Because it isn't. It's not even the worst Sony movie. But it is a bad movie, and it deserves all the hate it gets because it embodies pretty much everything that's wrong with the modern film industry, in the sense that it's a shallow, soulless cash grab made to capitalize on a well-known pre-established property, while at the same time pushing as many product placements as possible. Well, it's a kid's movie, so you can't really- Stop right there! I don't care if it's not- I don't care if I'm not the intended audience, because if a, a movie should be able to stand on its own merits. When there are plenty of kids movies out there that are genuinely good, you can't excuse a bad kids movie by holding it to a lower standard. A bad movie is a bad movie, and me being an adult doesn't change that. Actually, the fact that this is a kids movie makes its failings even more egregious. I can almost forgive a movie for being an 86 minute commercial when it's aimed at adults, but the fact that it's aimed at impressionable children makes it not just a bad movie, but an immoral one. If anything, children's media should be held to a higher standard than adult movies because the media children are exposed to is what shapes their minds. No responsible parent should knowingly expose their children to the emoji movie, unless they like the idea of their kids growing up to become mindless, social media obsessed apple zombies. So piss off with that, it's just a kids movie crap, alright? Anyway, let's get started. The Premise In the second chapter of The Anatomy of Story, John Truby argues that the premise is the foundation for any story. And if you don't have a good foundation, then nothing else in the story will work. Not the characters, not the plot, not the theme, nothing. Failing at the premise is like failing a test before you even enter the room. But it's where most writers fail, and it's the reason the vast majority of screenplays that get written never get sold or made into movies. But when we're talking about something like the Emoji Movie, which is obviously written on commission because the studio had already cynically decided they wanted to make a movie about emojis purely for marketing reasons and didn't actually care about the quality, that it's not only possible that this movie was made despite failing at the premise, it's probable. So is the idea of making a movie based on emojis inherently bad? I'll answer that question in a minute, but it does reek of corporate cynicism. When you take something that everybody knows about, something that isn't even a narrative property like a novel or a TV show, and try to adapt it into a movie, it shouldn't come as a surprise when people think you're scraping the bottom of the barrel for a des desperate grab at their money. While I disagree with the notion that there are no bad ideas, just badly executed ones, I'm not convinced that it would have been impossible for the Emoji movie to at least be passable if this project was handled by people who cared enough to try. Unfortunately, this movie was made by Sony, the most shallow and blatantly money-grubbing of all the major studios. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with product placements. Movies have to get funded somehow, and as long as they're in the background and the movie isn't going to be isn't going out of the way to draw attention to them in any way that distracts from the story, they can they can be forgiven. However, where most studios will put product placements in their movies to help fund the production of those movies, Sony makes movies specifically to put product placements in them. And wouldn't you know it, the Emoji Movie is one giant product placement after another. Entire scenes are built around trying to sell some app or mobile game. So instead of uh, following a coherent narrative that flows naturally from one scene to the next according to a logical causal chain, otherwise known as a plot, the characters are conveniently shuffled from one product placement set piece to the next. Oh, they're in the YouTube app now. Oh, now they're in Candy Crush. Oh, now they're, they're in some dancing game. It shows a lack of passion when the whole story is obviously written for the explicit purpose of shoehorning in products. Regardless of whether or not it's even possible to make a movie about emojis good, this movie was doomed to be terrible because Sony was interested in telling a good story. The whole point of this movie, the only reason it exists, is to advertise. If you paid to see this movie, you quite literally paid to sit through an 86 minute commercial for the Google Play Store. So the movie predictably turned out to be bland corporate garbage with no soul. But did this movie have to be bad? Is the very concept of an Emoji Movie inherently flawed? People like to compare the Emoji Movie to the Lego Movie because the Lego Movie was also adapted from a non-narrative property and is essentially a, re a really long and expensive commercial. But people generally like the Lego Movie because it was actually made with passion, which is clearly visible in the film. The animation was made with self-imposed limitations, which restricted the animators to only make things that could be built with actual Lego, and have them 
only move in ways which actual LEGO creations could move. Despite this, they still showed a wide range of creativity that's permitted by these toys. And the same theme is reflected in the narrative. The whole story is centered around the conflict between those who follow instructions and those who do things their own way, which represent the various playstyles that are encouraged by LEGO. The movie is both celebrating the product it's based on, while still being a creative and unique movie, and it manages this by keeping true to the spirit of LEGO, which is all about the act of creation. But could the same thing be done with emojis? What is the spirit of emojis, and could the same thing be translated into a movie? Well, what is the point of an emoji? The little pictures people use to represent abstract concepts when you're too lazy to write out a full sentence describing your thoughts, which makes the emoji a symbol of our society's slowly eroding communication skills as we become increasingly detached from each other despite social media theoretically making it easier to talk to each other than at any other point in history before now. The ironic thing is, if you're an English speaker, you have the advantage of what is quite possibly the most expressive of all human languages. You have access to the widest and most diverse vocabulary, and you can convey all kinds of nuance and emotion in your writing with varying degrees of precision and or ambiguity through your choice of words, phraseology, symbology, cadence, any of various rhetorical devices and context. That's why I find it bizarre that people elect to limit their mode of expression through the use of emojis instead of actual text and I see the use of emojis as an admission that one has little to say. The phrase, that's funny, contains the same essential information as a laughing emoji, except that actually writing out that's funny can have a whole mess of different meanings depending on the context it's used in, which makes it fundamentally more useful than an emoji. When you say that's funny, it could simply mean something is funny, or it could mean something is strange, or if said sarcastically, it could mean something is not funny. If you say something feels funny, it could mean it feels uncomfortable, or it could even be an expression of fear or apprehension. Subtext depends on context. But there is no subtext to a smiley face. It means exactly what it's designed to represent, and there's not much room for interpretation. So far from making it easier to communicate, it actually dumbs down language to the point of making it overly simplistic and incapable of carrying dense information or carrying complex ideas. If the Saber Wharf hypothesis is true, and the languages we speak influence the way we think, then emojis are actually making us dumber and less capable of critical thinking and analysis. That means emojis are like the real-life newspeak from 1984. Now, I'm not just ranting about how limited emojis are for the sake of hating on emojis, because this is relevant. This problem is present in the narrative of the movie. The whole plot is based on the fact that each emoji can only represent one very specific concept, and it becomes a problem when the main character, Gene, expresses the wrong emotion when he's called upon. And this problem can't be fixed by other emojis, because they're too limited in their modes of expression, and the problem is only solved at the end because Gene decided to go against his programming in a way that breaks the rules of his own universe. The very fact that emojis are limited is the basis of the plot, but the movie still tries to sell us on how great emojis are despite this admitted limitation, so it doesn't even succeed as an advertisement. But what if the movie didn't try to be an advertisement? Could the movie have worked if it embraced the limitations of emojis in order to make a point about the way humans communicate? Instead of celebrating the fact that modern humans in the industrialized world spend the bulk of their time staring at glowing rectangles, what if they made a movie condemning our over-reliance on social media and provided a positive message about spending time in the physical presence of other people and actually talking and expressing genuine emotions instead of exchanging tiny pictures that only approximate the most shallow representations of them? But the movie didn't do that because encouraging people to put down their damn phones for five minutes isn't conducive to selling apps and games. And that's the problem with the premise of an emoji movie. The very spirit of emojis is laziness and communication, so any movie that seeks to encourage their use is going to come across as shallow and anti-intellectual, just like this movie. And it's like the people who made the emoji movie were conscious of this because the movie actually has a visual gag of two teenagers bumping into each other from not paying attention due to being fixated on their phones. And there's even a joke about short attention spans in the opening narration. These people realized the stupidity of the premise, and they knew they were making a bad movie, but they did it anyway because Sony was paying them. That's corporate cynicism if I've ever seen it. The Plot I guess I should explain what actually happens in this movie for those of you who are privileged enough to have not been subjected to it. 
The Emoji Movie is about a world inside a kid's smartphone. In this world is the city of Textopolis, which is populated by emojis, and each emoji is supposed to have a single emotion. The crying emoji is always crying, the laughing emoji is always laughing, and so on. There are also various other emojis which represent objects, animals, or abstract concepts such as the poo emoji or the devil emoji, and so on. Our main character, Gene, is a meh emoji, which means he's supposed to be apathetic and disinterested in everything. Like any protagonist, he has a problem. His problem is that he has more than one emotion, which makes him an outcast in emoji society. On, this, on his first day on the job, he's called upon to be a meh emoji, but he panics and makes the wrong expression, causing the phone's owner, a teenager named Alex, to accidentally send the wrong emoji to Addie, the girl he likes, embarrassing him. The villain, Smiler, who runs Textopolis, tells Jean to come to her office, and he calls upon her antivirus bots to delete him since he's defective. Jean escapes, then runs into his friend High Five, who's upset that he used to be one of Alex's most used emojis, but has since been kicked out of the favorites section since Alex hasn't used him in over two weeks. High Five tells Jean that there's a hacker named Jailbreak who can reprogram him to only have one emotion, so he can fit into the emoji society and not have to be deleted. High Five agrees to help Jean find Jailbreak, believing they can rewrite some code to get him back to the favorites section. High Five leads Jean outside the text app and shows him around the other apps for a while. Meanwhile, Smiler sends her antivirus bots to hunt down Gene. High Five leads Gene to a piracy app where they find Jailbreak. High Five seems to be surprised to find out that Jailbreak is a girl, which indicates that he has never met her before and raises the question of how he knew about her. But there's no time to ponder this plot hole because the antivirus bots show up and shoot up the place, and our heroes escape through some kind of tunnel and end up in Candy Crush, where Jailbreak and High Five have to play the game to save Gene from getting blown up. However, as they play the game, Alex's phone starts making game noises while he's trying to talk to Addie, embarrassing him again. Alex then calls up the phone store and schedules an appointment to get it fixed. When the appointment appears on Alex's calendar app, the emojis realize Alex is planning to get a factory reset, which will kill them all. You don't need to take a phone to the store to get a factory reset, but the plot needs to happen, so let's just ignore that. Now this is where we run into a major problem. The movie wants us to believe that Smiler is the bad guy in this movie because she wants to delete Gene. But the thing is, she has a really good reason for wanting to do that. She wants to delete Gene because Gene is a defect and his existence puts the entire phone at risk of having Alex take it to get reset, which would kill everyone in the phone. If they kill Gene, there's no longer a need for a factory reset and everybody will be saved, so Smiler is actually just doing what she can to save everybody. Now, I'm not trying to say Gene is in the wrong for wanting to save himself, but this movie is trying to have a hackneyed theme about being yourself, and having Gene's uniqueness be the very thing that threatens to destroy the universe just kind of undercuts that theme. In real life, most people don't endanger the entire world when they be themselves, so having the whole plot be centered around Gene nearly killing everyone by failing to conform undermines the thematic cohesion by reinforcing the idea that non-conformity is actually a bad thing, all the way up until the very end of the movie, when the movie tries to makes a complete 180 on this point at the last minute by having Gene save, save everyone through a plan that makes no sense. But don't worry, we'll get to that. After saving Gene from Candy Crush, Jailbreak explains a plan to go to the Dropbox app so they can upload themselves to the cloud, where they can access the source code she, so she can reprogram Gene. But they'll need to get past the firewall. The firewall uses face detection, so Gene, being a broken emoji, should be able to try different faces until one works. We'll just ignore the fact that a face detection system would be designed to detect hu a human face, not an emoji, because plot. While that's going on, Gene's parents go looking for him and end up in the YouTube app. They have an argument, then realize the antivirus bots are following them. They use the app to load up cat videos to distract the bots and get away. Then they break up. Gene, High Five, and Jailbreak travel through the code to get to the firewall. On the way, Jailbreak explains that she wants to use Gene to get past the firewall so she can escape into the cloud where she can be herself. They pass through the Just Dance app and High Five turns it on, causing them to be forced to play the game to escape. Since Jailbreak doesn't know how to dance, Jean has to encourage her, and they have a romantic moment. Because, you know, when you have a boy and a girl in, this, in a movie together, they have to fall in love, right? Jailbreak accidentally loses her hat and wig, revealing her hair and crown. It turns out she's actually a princess emoji, but before she can explain, the antivirus bots show up. 
All of the dancing causes the app to make noises while Alex is in the middle of class, embarrassing him again and prompting him to delete the app. Gene and Jailbreak narrowly escape, but High Five gets thrown into the trash bin along with the, the app and all the antivirus bots. Gene convinces Jailbreak to help him rescue High Five. When Smiler realizes the antivirus bots are offline, she uses an illegal upgrade to create a giant antivirus bot. Jean and Jailbreak pass through the Spotify app and ride a music stream, because this is somehow the fastest way to the trash. I'll agree that modern music sucks, but that's a pretty harsh burn movie. Anyway, Jailbreak explains a little more about her backstory, and they have another romantic moment. Jean and Jailbreak rescue High Five from the trash, then they go on their way to Dropbox. Meanwhile, Jean's mom goes looking for Jean in the Instagram app, where she runs into Jean's dad. Jean's dad explains that Jean's malfunction comes from him, since he also has different expressions and he just learned to su suppress them. Jean's parents make up. Jean, Jailbreak, and High Five are on their way to Dropbox when the upgraded antivirus bot shows up and chases them. They manage to escape into Dropbox where the antivirus can't follow them because apparently illegal malware can't get into secure apps like Dropbox. This is about as stupid and misleading as those old Apple commercials which claims Macs don't get viruses. If people were dumb enough to be fooled by those commercials, then I can only assume there were people dumb enough to be fooled by the Emoji Movie. I hope those people don't reproduce. Our heroes finally make their way to the firewall. They try a bunch of different passwords while Gene makes different faces, but none of them work, and Gene gets repeatedly burned up. But then High Five mentions that he saw an email that Alex never sent while he was in the trash bin. It turns out that it was addressed to Addy, and it consists of Rihanna lyrics because Alex is a stupid teenager with no original thoughts and thinks pop songs are deep and meaningful. They try Addy's name as a password, and it works. The firewall opens, and they enter the cloud. As Jailbreak downloads the source code, Gene confesses his love for her, but she turns him down, saying she can't stay in the phone with him. This causes Gene to go numb and lose his emotions. Then suddenly, the antivirus bot shows up and snatches him, even though they're still in the Dropbox app, where they plainly said the antivirus couldn't follow them. Don't worry, it can't get in. It's illegal malware and this app is secure. Isn't it amazing how Hollywood can spend millions of dollars making a movie, but not bother to proofread their script? Jailbreak uses her princess powers to summon the Twitter logo, which is in the cloud for some reason, and she and High Five ride it back to Textopolis. This raises the question of why she didn't just summon the Twitter logo before, so she could simply fly to Dropbox. Was she really so dedicated to not letting anyone know that she was a princess, that she just had to force everyone to go the slow way through all the dangerous apps while being chased and put their lives at risk? That seems kind of selfish. Oh, I mean empowered, because she's a strong female character. Don't worry, I'll get to that. So even though Smiler has been trying to delete Gene this whole time, she decides to have him brought back to Textopolis to delete him in front of all the other emojis in some kind of public execution for no reason other than because poorly written movies like this one need villains to be stupid so the good guys have a chance to beat them. But before she can kill him, Gene's parents show up and then High Five and Jailbreak. Jailbreak hacks the antivirus bot and High Five presses the button that turns it off, causing it to fall over onto Smiler, crushing her. But there's no time to celebrate. Alex is at the phone store and the factory reset has begun. Gene comes up with a nonsensical plan to text Addy, so Alex will cancel the reset. Gene uses his ability to express multiple emotions to send a super expressive animated emoji to Alex's screen. Alex sees this and for some reason decides to send it to Addy. Inexplicably, Addy is impressed by this emoji and, get this, she tells Alex she likes his ability to express himself through the use of emojis. This causes Alex to decide to unplug his phone, canceling the reset and restoring everything that was deleted, saving Textopolis and everyone in the phone. <clears throat> Phones don't work that way, but whatever. Everyone cheers for Gene, and then the movie ends with a big Shrek-style dance number, and everyone celebrates their inability to recognize the horrifying reality that Alex is just going to throw the phone out a year later when he upgrades and they will all die anyway. Also, Alex's relationship with Addy is doomed to failure because they're both dumb, shallow, social media-obsessed teenagers who don't understand love nearly as well as they think they do. But never mind that, it's a happy ending. The Characters If you're some kind of helmet-wearing short bus rider who still needs help being convinced that this movie is one long advertisement, 
just look at the kid who owns the phone our emoji heroes live in. Alex has little to no discernible personality, so nobody can look at him and say, that's not something I would do. He has a very simple goal, which is to impress his crush at school, and his only visible flaw is that he's slightly awkward. The type of character any moron can understand and relate to. And he's even designed to be as ethnically ambiguous as possible, so even racists can relate to him, while at the same time preventing accusations of racism from the type of people who complain about movies having too many white people in them. Alex is the prototypical everyman, an intentionally boring, inoffensive, empty shell of a character that anybody can project themselves onto, the type of character that's perfect for a commercial. But Alex isn't the main character, so why does it matter that he's underdeveloped? Because it's common for animated movies about non-human characters to feature human characters in order to give the universe some grounding in reality and a point of reference for the audience. Toy Story has Andy, the kid who owns and plays with the toys. Inside Out has Riley, the kid whose head all of the emotions live inside of. Monsters Inc. has Boo, the kid who Sully and Mike have to hide from the rest of the monsters. Now, not all animated movies need to have human characters, but when they do, it's to establish some kind of framework and a set of rules for the worlds of the story. In Toy Story, the toy characters have to pretend to be inanimate when the humans are around, and this results in problems without simple solutions, which creates tension. But we also know enough about Andy as a character to understand the nature of the conflict. Andy starts off obsessed with all things having to do with Woody, and it's the reason Woody is the most important toy in the toy box. But when Andy becomes obsessed with Buzz and forgets about Woody, Woody is no longer at the top. Woody becomes jealous of Buzz and decides to take him down. Andy's preferences are what determine the nature of the conflict and therefore define the drama, as well as the plot. But in the Emoji movie, Alex is such an ill-defined character that doesn't even matter that he owns the phone. The phone could have just as easily belonged to a 40-year-old businessman instead of a teenager in high school, and it wouldn't have made a difference to the story world. The movie could have been made so that we never even see Alex, and it wouldn't have made much difference. They could have just had a character say, if we don't fix this, the master is going to factory reset us, and had the movie play out pretty much the same way. Actually, it might have been better if they left the phone's owner a mystery, because that would have invited the audience to try to figure out what kind of person owns the phone based on what apps are installed, and what their most and least used emojis are. Getting the audience to think is a good way to engage them, but it's not a good way to get them to buy things, so of course they weren't going to do that. Let's talk about the main character, Gene. He's the same protagonist you see in countless other kids' movies. The unpopular loser who's unsure of himself and struggles with his identity. The type of character anyone can relate to. Now, that in itself isn't a bad thing. But, if we compare this to the Lego movie again, it's interesting to see how these two movies approach what is essentially the same message. The importance of being yourself. Gene starts off the Emoji movie as an outcast who struggles to fit in, and ends the movie embracing his special traits. On the other hand, Emmett starts the Lego movie as already the perfect conformist and has to learn the virtue of being special. These are both perfectly valid approaches, but Emmett's character arc is more in sync with the central themes of his movie. Emmett starts off as a guy who only knows how to follow instructions. He gets thrust into a situation where he has to lead a bunch of people who only know how to do things by themselves, and is doubted for his lack of creativity. But when the bad guys attack, they escape in an improvised submarine, which falls apart because it was built by a bunch of different people with conflicting ideas and no coherent plan. Emmett then has to teach them to follow instructions, so they can work as a team to execute a plan to infiltrate the bad guy's tower. But the plan fails and everyone gets captured, but Emmett escapes and learns to embrace creativity to save the day at the end. Notice how the movie promotes the virtues of both planning and teamwork, and creativity and spontaneity which are both valid ways to play with Legos. Gene's character arc is much simpler. He starts off as an outcast who just wants to fit in, and he stays that way until the end when it turns out the thing that made him different is what saved the world. But it's also the thing that endangered the world because, remember, if he just did what he was supposed to in the first place, the world wouldn't have needed saving. So not only do we have a flat character who barely goes through any changes until the very end, the moral this movie is trying to have actually contradicts the plot. It doesn't make any thematic sense to have the hero's specialness be the thing that both endangers and saves the world, and it kind of just makes Gene look like a screw-up who manages to fix his mistake by intentionally repeating it. He's not the type of character most people would root for. Then there's Jailbreak, a character cynically designed to appeal to the feminist crowd, but doesn't even do a good job at it. 
She comes across as the type of character an anti-feminist would come up with to make fun of feminists. If she was fat and wore horn-rimmed glasses, I might have mistaken her for that. She's just another stereotypical, forced, strong female character, like the kind every movie has to have now. You know, the kind of female character who's smart, tough, has a snide attitude especially towards men, is independent, knows how to fight, and all the other crap that makes her the same character you've seen in a million other movies and TV shows. The type of character writers force into their works an obvious ploy to subvert female character tropes in order to score brownie points with the feminists. Hey, look at my strong female character. Look at how smart, independent, and capable she is. She ain't no damsel in distress. She ain't no distaff counterpart. She ain't no sexy lamp. Please don't call me sexist. And yes, I realize the Lego movie has wild style. But the difference is that movie is self-aware. And unlike some strong female characters, she doesn't have that groan-inducing, I'm always picking up after you boys attitude. Nor does she feel the need to prove how tough and capable she is by outright rejecting femininity. For example, by complaining about traditionally girly things like princesses. Nor does she act like she's just so strong and independent that she doesn't have time for a boyfriend. There is a middle ground, you know. When they create a character like Jailbreak, or any of these other action tough girls, they fail to see the irony that by stripping a female character of all her feminizing traits, they are in fact subtly implying that a female character can't be strong or compelling unless they are essentially a man in everything but appearance. It's sexist and self-defeating, but the cruelest irony is that while Jailbreak doesn't want to be defined by who she's rescued by or married to, she is still defined by being the token girl. Then there's High Five. He's the comic relief sidekick, and since this is a kid's movie, that means he has to be both stupid and fat. Because stupid and fat people are funny, right? Hey, you know what would go great without progressive feminist message? Fat and mental disability shaming. Also, High Five is a High Five emoji, right? But most of his humor is centered around him being fat. But he's a hand. A hand that likes to eat? I don't get it. I mean, there are a lot of funny things a hand can do, but I guess none of them would be appropriate for a kid's movie. So instead, we get fat jokes. I, I don't know, his entire character is stupid and it doesn't make any sense. The Politics I didn't want to get political when reviewing a movie about emojis of all things, but when that movie has a cliched, girl power, strong female character who says things like this... You know, women are always coming up with stuff that men are taking credit for. It kind of invites it. So like a few other movies recently made by Sony, they tried to shoehorn in a trite feminist message. And much like feminism itself, it doesn't make any sense. There's a scene where Jailbreak explains that with the first generation of emojis, female emojis can only be princesses or brides. But that's not even true. Yes, the bride and princess emojis are clearly made to look female, but that doesn't, that doesn't imply that all the other emojis are necessarily male. A yellow smiley face has no gendered traits, so you can't say it's either male or female, and it even has unnaturally yellow skin, so it doesn't have a race either. So it can represent anyone. It's just that when you need an emoji for a bride or a princess, you specifically need it to be gendered because brides and princesses are female by definition. Any of the other non-gendered emojis can just as easily be female if you want them to be, because they're specifically designed to be gender ambiguous. And even if it was true, so what? It's obviously not true now. So why is Jailbreak harping on about this oh-so-pressing and important social injustice? Furthermore, it's not even true within the context of this movie's universe. Smiler claims she's the original emoji. I was the original emoji. Which is to imply that she was around during the first generation, and she's neither a princess or a bride. And she's also the leader of Textopolis, which makes her the most powerful emoji. That right there kind of undercuts Jailbreak's female oppression narrative, doesn't it? And when it comes to the logic of the idea that a character being a princess is somehow sexist, let me just point out that to be a princess is quite possibly the most privileged position anybody can have, considering a princess, as depicted in cartoons, has all of the wealth and power of a king or a queen, but none of the responsibility, which is why it's such an appealing concept to little girls in the first place. While feminists harp on about things like He-Man and G.I. Joe being male power fantasies, a princess is the definition of a female power fantasy. But that's not why feminists hate princesses. They hate them because, in their mind, princess is synonymous with damsel in distress. Oh, how horrible. How oppressed a woman must be that she can expect a man to risk his life in an attempt to rescue her. 
It's not like that implies a woman's life is inherently more valuable than a man's, or that a man needs to prove his value by sacrificing himself mentally, physically, and emotionally for the benefit of a woman. And understand that me disagreeing with the politics isn't what's at issue here. The movie isn't even consistent with its own politics. I don't understand the logic of having a feminist message in your movie, and then making the main villain a powerful woman. I also don't understand the logic of hating on princesses, and then revealing that the female lead is a princess. I also don't understand how you can have both a be-yourself message and a feminist message in the same movie, when feminists have demonstrated that they don't support the idea of women being themselves when they do things like chastise women for being stay-at-home moms, and assault other women for being conservative. It's almost like this movie is trying to have its cake and eat it. Like it knows how forced its feminist pandering is, but it's going through with it anyway just so it can, just so it can undercut it. Well, you know what? Acknowledging the thematic inconsistencies in your movie doesn't excuse the fact that you have in thematic inconsistencies in your movie. The political pandering also hurts the comedy of this movie. While the movie does make jokes at the expense of people with eating disorders, which is a big feminist no-no, I think that's the result of the writers not caring enough about the, to keep the movie consistent. But it also goes to show an inherent problem with trying to make a movie that caters toward the progressive audience. Scientifically speaking, the reason we laugh at things is because our hairy ancestors would make calls to warn each other of danger, and then make different calls to signal that the threat was gone. As we evolved, the safety signal evolved into what we call laughter. And the reason we laugh at jokes is because they establish an expectation and then subvert it, which triggers a threat response in our dumb animal brains, which is then overwritten by the realization that there is no threat, resulting in laughter. That's the key to comedy using surprise to catch an audience off guard, and then having them realize there's no threat at the same time. And there are a number of ways to do this, but the most effective way is to challenge their social standards. I'll give you an example. Black people are like lobsters. They never die of old age. The reason that's funny is because a part of you knows that you should be offended by a joke implying that black people tend to die of unnatural causes. But you laugh because it's a challenge to your social conditioning, which is to be offended by racism, and that triggers your subconscious threat response, along with your relief response once you realize there is no actual threat. But more importantly, it calls attention to a societal issue which you might not have otherwise been willing to acknowledge. The whole purpose of comedy is to challenge societal mores, or highlight the absurdity of certain aspects of our culture through exaggeration and juxtaposition. You have to risk being offensive in order to be funny, because if your comedy isn't offending someone, then it's not doing its job. This is why comedy comes to a dead end when you try to cater it toward the politically correct crowd. When you try to make comedy catering toward people who are best known for going out of the way to find things to be offended by, just so they can condemn it and show off to all their progressive friends on social media how not racist or not sexist or not whateverist they are, or better yet, whine about how much of a victim it makes them in order to get attention and cry bully others into submitting to their will, well, you're kind of just pissing in the wind. So when you can't make jokes that challenge your audience, when your target audience is people who are adamantly opposed to being challenged, that means you're limited to the most childish and lowbrow of humor, like poop and fart jokes. You're so soft, poop. Not too soft, I hope. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with poop and fart jokes in and of themselves, but there's nothing witty or challenging about simply acknowledging the existence of excrement. You need to employ some kind of technique. You could attack society's reverence for royalty by showing Queen Elizabeth sitting on a toilet, or attack the romanticized Hollywood depiction of death by showing a recently deceased person voiding their bowels. Simply saying LOL poop is the bare minimum of what could even be called comedy, but that's all you can get away with when you're afraid of offending some special snowflake somewhere. That's enough. Having spent so many hours of my life watching the Emoji movie, writing the script for this video, recording the voiceover, and then editing this video together, I can say I've spent far more of my energy and attention on this movie than it deserves. But so did all the people who made it. From a technical standpoint, this movie has some decent animation. I mean, it's not like the Lego movie, but it's competent. And it's really sad that so many talented people were put to work on the Emoji movie, when the skills would have been put to better use on a movie that actually matters, and is more than just another cynical cash grab. But the most infuriating thing about it is that this movie made money. Whenever a movie like this is successful, that tells Hollywood executives that they could continue making money with movies just like this. 
Why should they care whether or not their movies are actually good if audiences are willing to pay to watch any creatively bankrupt garbage? This is why we keep getting movies like Transformers, Minions, Justice League, and Jurassic World, while new and challenging ideas get pushed further and further toward the back of the shelf. I started this review by saying the Emoji Movie is everything that's wrong with Hollywood, but the fact that the era of good movies is dead is really our fault. We, the audience, let the Emoji Movie happen. We, the audience, killed movies with our own low standards. F*** us. So that's it. Like, comment, subscribe, and support me on Patreon. Uh, I'm gonna shout out my $10 patrons now. Blandest. Charles J. Harris. Keith Paul. Lex Reardon, Paco, and Victor Gunter. <laughs> <laughs>